Whose streets? streets? Whose streets? streets? Show me what democracy looks like. All right. Thank you so much for being here. We are ready to formally get started. Um, my name is Edward Wolcher. I am the curator of lectures here at Town Hall, and it is my incredible honor to welcome you to this 20th anniversary gathering to celebrate the incredible accomplishment that was the WTO protest movement here in Seattle in 1999, and to talk about what comes next. Uh, Town Hall is honored to co-produce this event in coalition with our top line partners at CAGJ and UFCW 21, coalition organizations that bring together the best of the labor, environmental, indigenous rights, and social justice movements of 1999, as well as all of the other great organizations and institutions and activists who are in the building today. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Town Hall, this is a somewhat unusual day for us in terms of how we normally do things. This is a big day with lots to do and see and actually get involved. But for Town Hall, this is actually getting back to our roots. This building was a host to many gatherings and activist meetings during the 1999 protest movement. It's a little bit before my time here, although I am proud to say that as a 15-year-old ninth grader in high school, I did participate in the first day of protests in 1999. How many people in this room were here, uh, were at those protests 20 years ago? Awesome. Solidarity. Um, so today is a big day um, for Town Hall. It's a celebration for us and, of course, for all of the incredible activist energy that put together this program today and that has been carrying on the movement ever since. Uh, for those of you who are back in this building for the first time after a while, you might have noticed that we've done a big remodel, so welcome. We're so honored to be back up and running. This is exactly why this building exists, to host programs like today for the community to not just hear from expertise on stage, but actually to get involved, channel the expertise of our community. This is what democracy looks like, and thank you so much for being here. Um, awesome. Thank you. The bathrooms are awesome. Uh, <laughs> from your mouth to God's ears, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, we are, that, the bathrooms were the number one thing, although I will say that you are about $5 million more earthquake safe than you were two years ago, so that was the other big thing. So uh, much appreciated to all of you for being here. I know that this is the core audience in this room of activists, community organizers, and folks for whom Town Hall is a, a, a core institution, so thank you for being here today. I look forward to all of the opportunities to hear and to um, speak with you all today at the workshops, at the gatherings on stage, so thank you so much. The last thing I will say is that Town Hall um, traditionally does the land acknowledgement. I want to, of course, acknowledge that we gather on the territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish tribe. But since indigenous rights is such a key part of this movement, and to think globally and act locally in a place like Seattle that sits on unceded territory of the Duwamish tribe, a tribe that is fighting for federal recognition, it is critically important that we center our discussion on indigenous movements and indigenous people. And so I'm profoundly honored to be able to welcome to the stage Ken Workman, the fourth great-grandson of the namesake of our great community, Chief South. Uh, Ken will talk a little bit about that movement and center us for our work today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Edward. Uh, lab, this word, it means look. Lu, it means listen. Hide, it means think. So lab, you have lu, you have qua, sesai. Look, hear, listen, decide. How apropos. Many of you have seen me speak before, and so you've heard this, and I've given a, been given an opportunity to change how, what I say and how I say it. But this past presentation, fix this thought in my head that this is a small planet today it used to be big as far as we could see everything was right here to us to Amish people we we've been here for a long long time and there was never ever a need to move for 10,000 years we've been here longer really since the ice age on these hills that haven't changed a whole lot uh, the topography is still here. The trees, well, they're gone. Uh, some of the streams are still here. 
Some of the fields are still here. And so on the planet today, when we talk like this as native people, it's important to remember that we're all native. We're all native to this planet. And so it's important for us to take care of it. And then, so I'm reminded of what my grandfather, when I say grandfather, I really mean the person that the world knows as Chief Seattle, because this would be my great, 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 great grandfather. So by way of formal introduction, I probably should make that clear. I am workman of the Duwamish tribe. And that just simply means great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. I know we run through our mothers and our fathers and our aunties and our uncles and our cousins and, and all manner of relatives until we start seeing heads that nod, go, oh, now I know who you are and who your family is. So I just cut to the chase. I keep it as short as I can. I'm retired now from modern industry, from this large airplane manufacturing plant down the road uh, called Boeing, where I worked in uh, flight operations engineering as a systems and data analyst. And so this is what a modern Indian looks like. We look just like everybody else. We talk like everybody else. But what we also carry is all of our ancestors with us. And so in 1855, when my grandfather's getting ready to sign away all of this land that you're sitting on today in this uh, Point Elliott Treaty. The very first thing he asked for of uh, Isaac Stevens, the then governor at that time, was unencumbered access to our burial grounds. See, this is very important to us. This planet, this place, this dirt, this soil. He asked for that. And then he mentioned to the then governor, you abandon your dead and you think they're powerless, but they're not entirely powerless. And how the ground is more loving to our feet than it is to yours. So imagine walking around with no shoes on. So the cells of our feet are in direct contact with the earth, with the mud, with the grass, with the leaves that fall on the ground. And this is who we are. And so this is how we know our ancestors. In these hills for 10,000 years, all of that material that was grandma and grandpa and aunties and uncles and cousins that have passed, they're down in the ground. They're underneath your foundations. They're underneath the streets. They're underneath the parking lots. And so they're still here. And then he said, when the lights are out, and the streets are empty, they will throng with the ghosts of my people. So as we sit in this old, old building right here today, freshly restored building, very nice, <laughs> that I would remind you that when you put all of this stuff together in the context of modern science, you realize what he was saying, was that all of that stuff, that biological material, that's the ancestors of the Duwamish people, it gets sucked up into the trees every spring when the snows go away and the cold goes away and all things come alive again. And all that stuff that was aunties and uncles, te yayilab, yata, kaya, yafsapa, the ancient ones that have passed, the grandmas and the grandpas, haliyas istahate, swaswatufte, that they live again, they live in the trees. And so we recognize this. And so saving this planet is important to us because not only are we, are we working to save the resources for modern people that are alive today and for those future generations, but we're also saving it because all of those people that are still down in the ground. And so when he said, when the lights are out and the streets are empty, they will throng with the ghosts of my people. What he was talking about was the DNA of the Duwamish people being in the literal construct of these old buildings, in the wood, in the timbers. And so, of course, of course the ghosts are throughout Seattle. In these ancient timbers, they still live. And so it's important for us to take care of this place. And so we try to say thank you. Thank you for as much work as we can. Uh, for all the work that's being done because we recognize that our ancestors are not only in 
the trees, but they're in the grass and they're in the very berries that we use to consume. And so we say, which is thanking grandma and grandpa and all those people that have passed for their life. That we see you in the very food that we're about to consume today. This is who we are as the Wamish people, that we are a part of nature. And this is who we all are as members of this planet Earth, that we're breathing the very air that the dinosaurs were breathing. We're breathing the very air that our ancient people were breathing. And we're appreciating the work that they have provided for us. And so we say, Asquadidijit Bhakti Bhakti Yayalab Twal. Um, Dagui Heko Oyayus. I sort of had to make that up. <laughs> but it was simply thanking all of those people that have passed for all of the work that they have done, that we can be here today and we can talk like this and we can present to you like this and that we can all appreciate this planet that we're living on. And so we say, Gunol Chish because this is the word that the Tlingit people know as thank you. And then we say Hawa, because the Haida who lived 300 miles south of the Tlingit um, on the northern Canadian border, the Hawa, and the southern Alaska border, the Tlingit. Uh, this is their word, Deutschkam, uh, Simpson. They live 100 miles east of the Hawa. Tleiko is the word that the Makah and the Nuchinalt use up on Vancouver Island and in, in, uh, at the northern tip of the San Juan Strait right there, Washington State. Tig is the word used just north of us for the Snohomish and the uh, Tulalips. Heiska, if you're Saanich, if you're Lummi, from the Canadian border right up there by Blaine. Uh, Kwadi right here. If you're Suquamish, Duwamish, Snoqualmie, Muckleshoot, Puyallup, Stillicum. And so when you hear me say, This is simply, thank you, my friends, for driving on these nasty streets in Seattle to get here today. <laughs> Masi is the word that the Chinook use, the Chinook at the mouth of the Columbia River. Wapilatanka, for the people, the Lakota people, who have put up this fantastic fight for this pipeline that's going through. And so we recognize the work that's being done by those people and say, so we say, Wapilatanka de Siaya to a Dugwi Hutch. Thank you, my friends, for your heart. Twadugwi Waluf for your strength. Um Migwich, because we have people from Toronto and Quebec that live out here too, and this is their word. And by saying these words out in the open, in this way that we weren't allowed to speak for, for so very long, it's important that these things are coming back and that we're taking back, once again, those things that are ours, including the very ground that we're on, and showing the appreciation for all the work that has gone before us. And so we say all of these things. And so I will conclude with this. Just as my grandfather stood on the shores of Alki, not seven miles or so away from here, 168 years ago, and he says, La Ate Duams. Come ashore, my friends. You are welcome here onto this land. Gui. This word it means welcome. And so we say that very same thing today. And so we say, Gui Gui Hidak Ba. Which simply means we welcome all people from around Squaiswatufted, Mother Earth, onto this place, the ancient lands of the Duwamish people. So thank you. You are welcome here. <laughs> Between 
your town and my town, there's a point and a line. The line says don't cross the point, closed way. And so among all peoples, line and point, point and line, ha. Huh. With so many dots and dashes, the map is like a telegraph. But walking around the world, you see rivers and mountains, you see jungles, deserts, oceans, mountains, but no points, no lines, because those things don't really exist, but they were designed so that my hunger and your hunger will always be separated. Entre tu pueblo y mi pueblo hay un punto y una raya. Entre tu pueblo y mi pueblo hay un punto y una raya. La raya dice no hay paso y el punto vive. La raya dice no hay paso y el punto vía cerrada. Y así entre todos los pueblos, raya y punto, punto y raya. Y así entre todos los pueblos, raya y punto, punto y raya. Con tantas rayas y puntos, el mapa es un telegrama. Con tantas rayas y puntos, el mapa es un telegrama. Caminando por el mundo se ven ríos y montañas. Caminando por el mundo se ven ríos y montañas. Se ven selvas y desiertos, pero ni puntos ni rayas. Se ven selvas y desiertos, pero ni puntos ni rayas. Porque esas cosas no existen, sino que fueron trazadas porque esas cosas no existen sino que fueron trazadas para que mi hambre y la tuya estén siempre separadas para que mi hambre y la tuya 
estén siempre separadas. Welcome. We are your MCs today. My name is Heather Day. I'm the director and co-founder of Community Alliance for Global Justice. Thanks so much to our many members who are here and our founding director, Jeremy, who's here is really lovely. We came out of the 1999 protests, so for our organization, it's very important to mark this anniversary and make sure that this history is known in Seattle. And today we work to strengthen the food sovereignty movement locally, regionally, and globally. And my name is Kristen Beifus, and I'm um, here on behalf of the 46,000 grocery, retail, healthcare, food processing, linen, cannabis, and many other workers across, right? <laughs> it's our new field, um, <laughs> across the state of Washington. Um, who also um, participated many um, 20 years ago um, and um, feel very committed um, to being here with our visionary ally, um, CAGJ, in this community treasure town hall. Welcome to, oh, yeah. welcome. Welcome to, to another, another World is possible, possible, WTO plus 20. <laughs> How a people's uprising shut down the World Trade Organization in 99 and why it matters for today's movement for justice. So we're going to start off with um, a little bit of gratitude and offer some appreciation for David Solnit and Simone Adler for the incredible theater that we kicked off this event with. <laughs> Woo! Let me hear you. And also um, for that incredibly generous welcome from Ken Workman. And also, of course, for the beautiful music, which was offered, I think, like a year ago. And um, so appreciate Coreo Aereo. Thank you. We also want to give a huge thank to Town Hall Seattle for sponsoring this event with all of our organizations and the many sponsors, um, co-sponsors and community partners who you can see listed in your program. In 1999, I had the privilege of participating in the organizing leading up to the WTO protests in Seattle. It was actually part of my job as an organizer with CISPIS, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. It was a life-changing event, as many if not every one of the tens of thousands of people who participated will tell you. For me, it was a profoundly humanizing experience that I, still brings me to tears when I share the history with our interns, as I do frequently. There are many stories we can tell about the battle in Seattle, and history, like all history, is contested. It's important to recognize the resistance movements that fed into making the Seattle protests such a success and the global solidarity, including demonstrations around the globe that week. What I think is most significant is that the WTO protests were a tremendously powerful example of a people's uprising that had long lasting repercussions and ripple effects. The World Trade Organization, founded just pre four years previously, was planning to expand at the Seattle meeting, which united opposition across a huge spectrum of sectors. Not everyone agreed about why we were protesting, or even how, but there was room for multiple tactics and multiple critiques, from calling on reform to calling for the WTO to be abolished. And thanks to the dedication of hundreds of organizers over many months, tens of thousands of people showed up and were treated not only to the big day of action, which was Tuesday, November 30th, but a full week of marches, educational forums, and direct actions. And on November 30th, we won our first major victory of that week. Through coordinated direct action, we shut down the opening ceremony of the World Trade Organization. We shut it down. That's what we set out to do, and we did it. 
And by the end of that week, after daily protests, despite the National Guard being called out, despite brutal repression from the police, Global South delegates refused consensus and the WTO and the talks collapsed. I will never forget the moment I heard the news. I was standing outside the West End Hotel in the cold with hundreds of others while people were guarding the exits and locked their necks to the, to the doors to prevent ministers from leaving town while our sisters and brothers were still in jail. And the announcement came over someone's cell phone. Not everyone had a cell phone then. So it was very exciting. And we wept in joy and then we danced and chanted, this is what democracy looks like, this is democracy feels like, this is what democracy tastes like. And this, remember, was the era when Margaret Thatcher came up with a little acronym to keep us down. The Prime Minister of England who pushed the same menu of privatization of our commons, free trade, and deregulation as Ronald Reagan did, told us, Tina, there is no alternative to neoliberalism. And yet the WTO at the center of the corporate power structure never achieved their hope for expansion after 1999. And that's something not everyone realizes. That's a huge part of why it was such a major victory. Perhaps most importantly, as Stephanie Galuda Project South has written, we made it happen because we imagined we could. And the experience captured our imaginations. We saw and felt our collective power. We felt collective liberation, and it pushed us to dream bigger dreams. We were making another world possible and how we stood by each other all week in solidarity. Our beautiful week of protest taught us to believe in ourselves, to believe we can win a struggle for a better world. And so it matters that we celebrate. It matters that we learn from our mistakes, too, and keep growing our movements, which is why we're focused today not just on telling our stories from 1999, but on learning the tools we need to make another world possible today. So thank you so much for being with us. So we and many other labor and unorganized workers took part 20 years ago in the people shutdown of the WTO. Our roots also extend back 100 years, beyond 100 years, but 100 years to the 1919 Seattle General Strike. <laughs> Probably not many of us were there at that time. <laughs> Congratulations if you are, let us know how you're doing it. Um, this was where so-called skilled and unskilled workers in the shipyard were being pitted against each other by profit-driven corporations of the time. Tapping into the pain and frustration of being degraded as disposable and subhuman, over 65,000 workers from over 100 unions withheld their labor for a week. They interrupted the flow of business as usual they went against the stream, not only by taking their bodies out of the system that was oppressing them, they also celebrated their humanity with community gatherings, exchanging ideas, sharing music, art, food. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? We are here today because we know our lives and the earth depend on us and many others disrupting the status quo through direct action. We have a unique opportunity to individually and collectively explore the power of embodied actions that say yes to ourselves in the world that we know is possible. From claiming physical space where we have been excluded because of how we look or where we come from, to speaking our truth when it's not part of the official program, to stopping something dangerous by putting our bodies in its path. Direct action enables us to enact what tends to only reside in our imagination. We invite you today to connect with your truth in your heart and in your gut and investigate what direct, what direct action means for you. Bring your fullest creative self and your deepest hope for what we can do together. Now we're gonna take just a couple moments to ground in ourselves. In silence, if you could just 
Feel what's present for you. You can close your eyes. You can leave your eyes open. Might be a little anticipation. Perhaps some curiosity. Maybe some nostalgia. Now without words, from within, extend outwards so everyone can share in what you are bringing here today and you can be fortified by those around you. If you've closed your eyes, please open them and look around at all who are here behind you, to the sides of you. Soak it all in. Hmm. There's going to be time later when we will be talking with each other, which might move us more out of our bodies, out of our hearts, and more into our heads. This is a place that you can return to recharge if you need to. We're also going to be asking you to take part in contagious silence. This is what we're going to do when we need to bring the group back together. Heather and I will put up our hands. And when you see us, please also put up your hand. And oh, look, we're practicing. I love it. <laughs> put up your hands. <laughs> And both, I like Simone's into it. Put up your hands however you want. It could be a big, it could be a stretch opportunity. And pause your conversation until we are again grounded as a group and ready to move forward. We're so excited you're here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kristen. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction and overview of the day, and we have a slide. Um, so right now we're in the Great Hall, and we're here until noon, and then you're going to go all the way down to the Forum downstairs for lunch. Um, there's elevators that can take you down, and then um, Town Hall will help us find the stairs. It's a little bit confusing, but we'll all go downstairs for lunch. Um, and then you can get to choose which program you want to enjoy this afternoon. So if you're going to um, do the um, direct action training with Lisa Fithian, that's in the same space as lunch, so you can just stay there. And that's for three hours from 12.45 to 3.45. Or you can choose from three different workshops. Um, they're about an hour each. There are two that start at 12.45 the one focused on WTO with Deborah James, and the one focused on the Green New Deal with Matt Renley and Jess Wallach. So those are concurrent, so there's three things happening at once. You have to choose between them. When that, those workshops are over, you're welcome to join Lisa Fithian's training downstairs halfway through. Lisa's okay with that. Or you can go to La Resistencia's um, workshop on the campaign to shut down the Northwest Detention Center. Let's shut it down, right? We can do this. We shut down the WTO. We could shut down all the detention centers. Um, also, we want to encourage those who do social media to get out your phones and, you know, do the whole thing with the hashtags and stuff to help us get the word out because that helps tell the story and amplify. So here are some suggestions for tags and hashtags and all that stuff. <laughs> so um, I am now going to introduce our opening dialogue. The purpose of this dialogue is to tell the story of the 199 Direct Action, because not everybody here was there, and of course there's different stories to tell, um, and talk about the significance of the WTO protests, as well as to connect how direct action is central to many struggles for justice today. So if the speakers can start coming up to the stage, and maybe if you could claim our chair. Okay. Um, and we're calling this opening a dialogue as we'll invite our speakers to dialogue with one another. And a little bit later, we're going to invite you to dialogue with each other as well. Deborah James made it all the way from across the country. She's here. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm very, very excited to welcome Edgar Franks. 
Deborah James, Lisa Fithian, and Nancy Hawk. And Nancy's going to open the dialogue with a story about what happened in 1999. Great, thanks. Um, I'll stand up. I didn't re prepare any remarks, so I can't. I don't have anything to hide behind. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Heather, and um, you know, also as a fellow mom of a little person, I know how hard it is to organize. And I was getting emails from Heather at 11 p.m., at 6 a.m., all the times, and so I know how hard she worked to make this day possible. So thank you, Heather. Um, let's give her a hand. Um, and all the other folks who worked hard to make today happen. Um, so I have the honor of getting to talk about what was happening um, on this day 20 years ago. And I'll start with my own story, um, because that's how I'll start. Um, so at this time, on this day 20 years ago, I was laying on the street on a delightful piece of cardboard um, with my arms in lock boxes at the intersection of 7th and Olive. And I was chained um, in this PVC pipe to some of my friends who were in an affinity group called the Superstar Collective. And, um, and it was at just about this time of the morning that I heard some news that I thought was pretty exciting. I'd been laying there at that intersection for several hours at that point. I was cold, it was damp, and, um, and then, unbelievably, it stopped raining. A rainbow came out, for real. There was a rainbow, and I heard the news that people weren't able to get into the convention center, that maybe they had called the meetings off for the day. And I was overjoyed. Um, we'd won. Um, because, as we said, as we set out that morning at 5.30 a.m., which is hard for me now as a 25-year-old, it's exceptionally hard. <laughs> um, but um, what we said then is if we slow them down for a minute, we'll have won. If we slowed them down for a few seconds so they had to think about what they're doing and why they're here and what they're trying to do to our planet, we'll have won. And so to actually have shut down the meeting was a feeling of incredible victory and joy. And it felt like oh my God, this group of, this ragtag group <laughs> um, made something amazing happen. Um, but it didn't happen in a day and it didn't happen in a week. It happened all throughout the year of 1999 and beyond that. Because I know, um, as we'll hear from Vandana Shiva later this morning, Groups within the WTO, folks from the Global South had been organizing in and out of that body. But we didn't, in the US, we hadn't spent so much time thinking about the WTO because we hadn't had to. And I'll have to say for myself, in February of 1999, when my friend David Solnet said, hey, have you heard that the WTO is coming to Seattle? I think we should shut it down. I was like, what's the WTO? And so I think a lot of what we had to do that year was explain what it was. And, and I was not new to being active around global, globalization. Um, and so, you know, I had asked the city council of Portland, Oregon to declare Portland a multilateral agreement on investment free zone. Uh, you know, I'd been part of the anti sweatshop movement, fought against NAFTA, talked about the GATT, yet I'd never heard of the WTO because that's how secretive it was. That's how little people knew about it. And so the first thing I think we had to do in order to get people to come to Seattle to be part of that amazing day was educate them about the WTO. And so I just have to give a shout out to the old fashioned organizing that had happened um, in that year because it was, yeah, we didn't have cell phones. 
barely used the internet, there was no social media, and we just had to talk to people. And, um, and so that's what we did. And so for me at the time, I was part of um, a coalition of labor unions and community groups called Jobs with Justice. And um, we were, and I was able for my job to say, hey, listen, this amazing thing is happening. Um, maybe you could come to the labor march. We're organizing buses. And so going to union meetings, going to churches, going to, st going to universities, going to house parties with um, a pamphlet and a flip chart, because <laughs> that's what I had, and that's what we all had um, to organize. And so we were doing that, and then at the end of my meetings when I was telling people about the WTO and why they should care and why they should come to these meetings, we were saying there's also a direct action. So if you want to shut it down, see me later. Um, and so, um, and then the direct action organizing was happening in the evenings, um, on the weekends, all the time where we were having the same conversations, but we were also saying, so these meetings are happening in Seattle, here's why you should care, and hey, we're going to try to shut it down, and we're going to do it um, in a way that maybe mo many of us weren't familiar with. And so, um, so there's been a lot of articles coming out right now about the WTO and what happened. And who's seen the map, the map of Seattle with the convention center in the middle? Anybody seen that map? So, okay, so there's a map. and. I'm sorry I don't have it um, with me, um, but I just want to talk a little bit about... Oh, okay, it's going to be on a slideshow downstairs for those who are curious, because I want to just talk uh, just for a moment, too, about the how. Um, so we were organized pretty loosely um, in affinity groups. And the affinity groups was this idea that you took some of your good friends, people you knew, people you trusted, and you worked with them to figure out what your comfort levels were. So my comfort level was, yeah, maybe, sure. Yeah, I could get arrested, why not? Okay, um, and, then, um, and then other people were like, I would like to talk to the press, or I would like to help make sure everyone's safe, or I would like to be a medic. And so there's all these affinity groups, and we were, um, we formed with all of our affinity groups a spokes council, and um, we met for weeks and months, and um, and really looked at the convention center in the middle of Seattle, and then drew lines and divided the city into what we called pie slices. And my pie slice was K. We called it the key lime slice, um, and. Only have three minutes left. I have so much more to say, um, but um, you know, we we really had a lot of trust in each other, and so for my intersection, Seventh and Olive, as you all know, I was the only person who knew. Um, there was all these people who were willing to go out with me and take a street corner that morning, not knowing um, what what corner it would be, not knowing where they were going, not knowing where they were going to risk arrest. And so I feel like one of the things that was remarkable was the level of trust we had with each other and the level of connection we had um, in order to make what happened happened. And I have to say, there's a lot of different numbers about how many people were in Seattle that day. Some people say 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, 110,000. Um, you know, there's a lot of numbers. It, I don't think it actually matters um, that much in um, what was amazing about that day because I'm from Washington, D.C. That's where I grew up. I've been to many marches with hundreds of thousands of people. And what made the difference in Seattle was the thousands of people willing to risk arrest. The thousands of people saying, I will lay my body physically down, um, whether it's on a street corner or putting your neck in a bike lock. Um, but people were saying, I'm willing to lay down um, 
and I'm willing to put my body in between this machine, which is the WTO, and our planet. And it made all the difference in the world to a protest which would have gotten very little attention to something that we're still talking about today and still thinking about. And it wasn't just that we did civil disobedience. We were incredibly organized. So when I did get arrested on December 1st, before I spent five days in jail, um, you know, the police officer stood on our bus and he started reading us our Miranda rights and we all said right back to him, I choose to remain silent um, in unison and he started laughing because we had been trained so well in civil disobedience and we were ready and we were able um, to, um, to, you know, really know how to do civil disobedience, how to do lock boxes and so, um, my time is up. There's so much more to say. I'm glad you're here, and we're going to hear more from other speakers. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. I also want to welcome Paul Wagner, who's joined us on the stage, and will be speaking a little bit later on the panel. Welcome. So perhaps Vandana Shiva needs no introduction, but if, for those of you who may not know who she is, she's a renowned Indian activist who was in Seattle in 1999, and I'll never forget hearing her speak at Benna Royal Hall. One of the things Nancy didn't say is that the International Forum on Globalization organized one of the dozens of teach-ins, and there were over 3,000 people. It was completely packed two days in a row, and all of my heroes that I had learned about were there. It was incredible. And Vanda Nashiva was one of them. She's the founder of a food sovereignty organization called Navdanya, and we are partnered with her in calling out Bill Gates um, for his role in pushing corporate agriculture in Africa. Um, and when she found out about our gathering, um, she couldn't come, but she offered to send this video greeting that we'll now play. I wish I could personally have been in Seattle to celebrate Seattle 20 years later. Recolonization today is taking place through corporate free trade agreement. That's exactly what the WTO is. And it's just that they're going further and beyond what the first generation of colonizers did. The East India Company was created to grab the lands of 85% of the countries of the world, the wealth, the resources. In India, they signed a free trade agreement, 1716. So when I saw the GATT, when I saw the WTO, I realized that the empty land, Terranullius, had been replaced by the empty life, Bionullius, to now patent seed and claim that the corporations who were writing the agreements were the inventors. That's what the trade-related intellectual property rights was supposed to be. That's why I started Navdanya and started to save seeds, including climate resilient seeds that now Mr. Gates pretends he is inventing. All they do is today's piracy. You are the home of both the Seattle protests of 20 years ago. You're the home of the richest billionaires of the world. All we have to do is see how the billionaires became the billionaires they are through taxes for the poor and no taxes for the rich, free markets for the billionaires and closed markets for the hardworking small farmers, for the hardworking artisans. This world is upside down. It has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Way back, we had predicted in this report we wrote yoked to death, globalization and corporate control of agriculture, how this was going to be the death knell of Indian farmers. We've lost 400,000 farmers to suicide. A world governed by Monsanto and Bayer for seed, a world governed by Cargill for agriculture trade, a world governed by the junk food giants, Pepsi, Coke, Nestle, in terms of sanitary and phytosanitary measures, will destroy the last inch of land, the last drop of water, the last life form. It will destroy the right to food of people. That's why a billion people are hungry. And it will destroy our wonderful indigenous food cultures to force junk food and now fake food. Things like Impossible Burger on the world 
We said then, our world is not for sale. We are saying again, our world is not for sale. Now, they think they can create disposability of species and human beings. Extermination continues to be the project of colonization. We will not let other species go extinct. We will not let any human being be pushed to extinction because of injustice. That is our renewal 20 years later. It's a fight against extinction. It's a fight against climate catastrophe. It's a fight against privatization of water. It's a fight against the privatization of our commons, our education, our health. Let's join hands once again. We will make the difference. Thank you so much. That was so exciting to see um, Vandana, who is a founder, of course, of uh, the network that I coordinate, uh, Our World Is Not For Sale. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to all the organizers who've done such a great job. Uh, it's very exciting 20 years later. Um, so I'm going to get right into talking about what's going on with the WTO right now. One of the best investments that corporations can make is actually to change the rules under which they operate so that the rules allow them to extract more profits from the economy. And they've often used trade agreements to write the rules, really to rig the rules, to lock in uh, rights for them to profit while handcuffing government's ability to regulate in the public interest. And they do this through trade agreements because they would not be able to get these type of changes through normal democratic channels. So as we know, in the early 90s, uh, the big industries at that time, like big finance, big agriculture, and big pharma, lobbied their governments to change the rules um, and to lock in new agreements to give them rights to profit and lock out uh, public interest regulation. And that's how they were successful in changing the GATT to the WTO. After Seattle, because of Seattle actually, WTO boosters were only able to get developing countries to agree to a new round of negotiations to expand the WTO by claiming it would be a development round. Since then, unfortunately, developed countries have never agreed to deliver on their promises to address the constraints that bad rules had on developing countries. So what kind of rules are we talking about that developing countries have been demanding to be changed? Well, take agriculture. At the same time, that rich countries have been allowed to maintain their level of agriculture subsidies, which mostly are handed out to large agribusiness, not to small farmers, of course. Developing countries are still not allowed under WTO to subsidize food production for domestic consumption to guarantee food security in their countries. Unfair agriculture rules contribute to the global food crisis. We still have almost a billion people that still go to bed hungry at night in this world. And they keep developing countries from being able to benefit from fair trade. And yet the US is currently suing India, Vandana's company, country, in the WTO for implementing the largest food security program in the history of the world. We have a case against them right now. Ministerial after ministerial, and I have attended every one since Doha in 2001, developed countries have refused to agree to the development agenda which is basically to reduce the power of the WTO uh, over their economies. And instead, developed countries have pushed forward an agenda of further liberalization to benefit large corporations, even when our own workers, patients, farmers, and environment has come under fire. And the reality, after 20 years, is that developing the, the, the most developing countries that have actually gained from trade have actually been those that have traded with China, not with the rich countries under the rich country model of the WTO. And China's growth is usually attributed to not following the WTO model. So the truth is also that social movements, NGOs, and trade unions have been present at every decision-making moment of the WTO in the last 20 years. Our world is not for sale is the global coalition of about 250 
trade unions, environmental groups, public interest organizations, and development advocates from about 60 countries around the world, Global North and the Global South. That we were formed in the aftermath of Seattle to bring together the power of the social movements of organizations that could hold their governments accountable with the powerful analysis of people who were inside the negotiations following what was happening and figuring out what the potential impacts could be to alert communities around the world. So in 2001 in Doha, in 2003 in Cancun, many of us were there shutting down the negotiations as well, in 2005 in Hong Kong, in 2006 and 8 in mini ministerials in Geneva, 2011 again in Geneva, recently 2013 in Bali, and then in uh, Nairobi, Kenya in 2015, and the most recent one in 2017 in Buenos Aires. We have been there. And the conclusion is that we have been wildly successful in stopping the expansion of the WTO. There has only been one small expansion of multilateral rules since the initial organization was formed in 1995. But we have not been successful in transforming the current system and in changing the bad rules that still harm millions of people around the world. Well, think about the fact that the technology industry was not such a thing back then, okay, in 1994. So now big tech, is seeking to use the same pathway, use trade agreements to rig the rules around digitalization and technology, particularly around the most valuable resource in the world today, which is data. So how do they do that? Well, in the US, we know there are 566 formal trade advisors. They come from subfederal government, academia, law, NGOs, labor, and the business community. The business community has 85% of the official advisors, and the rest of us share 15%. But of course, that's just the official advisors, right? What's worse is obviously the influence. And we know, for example, that even Obama met with Google then more than any other corporation while he was president. And unfortunately, Trump has continued the same pro-big tech policies. So when we think about what, what is it that they're trying to do now in the WTO, okay? Well, they want to consolidate their business model is the, is the easiest way of thinking about it. So what is their business model? We're very familiar with it. Gaining rights to operate in markets, rights to operate in markets where countries can't keep them out. Locking in deregulation. We're all familiar with how big tech operates, Airbnb, Uber, in a, a total regulatory gray zone, breaking laws all the time. Accessing an infinite supply of cheap labor. I think we've all seen that with the Amazon work uh, strikes this weekend on, on Black Friday. It was very exciting. Think about this. Almost all of the economic gains of productivity increases, which is basically technology, the changes of technology that allow a worker to produce more, almost all the gains in recent decades have gone to capital. Very little of it has gone to labor. Okay? Not because... Uh, of any other reason than that giant corporations have intervened in the policy making process to rig the rules to distribute the benefits of worker productivity to capital. That increasingly unequal distribution of technological gains will accelerate tremendously if the proposed rigged rules are agreed to. And we are seeing today, as I'm sure many of you have followed, con uh, uprisings on four continents most of them are about inequality and austerity, the same things we're seeing here at home. So, gaining rights, deregulation, cheap labor. They also want to maintain their monopoly positions by shutting out or buying up competitors. We all know that's how these corporations operate, even though they call themselves, you know, innovators and startups. They want to ban governments from being able to require the disclosure of algorithms, okay? They want to uh, strengthen their intellectual property. So think about this. We are increasingly seeing AI used in hiring and firing, in judicial sentencing, okay, in allocating police resources, in redlining, in housing decisions, in whether or not you're going to get a loan, whether or not you're going to get medical care, whether or not you're going to get public services, and they want to put all those algorithms into a black box so that regulators and the public and trade unions don't have access to see how those algorithms are making decisions. So it has huge implications for fairness and equity in the future. They want to not have to pay taxes. I don't have to explain that one to anyone. When you are sitting here with Amazon paying no federal taxes on $11.2 billion in profits last year and they got a refund. There are seven different provisions in the proposed rules that would allow them not to have to pay taxes. Not even tariffs, nor 
corporate taxes. At the same time that there's all this brouhaha in the world, oh, we need to get these corporations to pay more taxes, those same governments are going behind their finance ministries and saying, let's make sure that these cor digital corporations never have to pay taxes. They also want a ban on development policies. So you can see it. They want the rights to operate in developing countries, and they want the governments banned from being able to use any policies to make sure that their people can benefit from the presence of that transnational corporation. It's really appalling. I can explain that more in the workshop. So while the digital divide on access to the internet has been narrowing, what we're actually seeing in the world is that the gap of the economic benefits of digitalization and technology is actually widening, such that in recent years, almost all of the benefits of, um, of uh, digitalization have gone to only two countries. And we're not talking about countries, we're talking about just a few corporations in the US and China that have been benefiting from that. And of course the crown jewel of uh, digital trade is to be able to collect legally or legally massive troves of personal social business data and use it however they want. And I'll just give you one small example to think about. There are drones now taking pictures of farms in, in a very poor country called Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa, as I'm sure they are in most countries around the world. And what are they using those pictures for? To help the farmers increase their productivity and climate resilience? Or maybe to cut down on child labor in the cocoa industry? No, they're using it to give speculators an edge on putting their positions on securities in the global markets, which means, again, a great example of how they're using digitalization to further extract resources from the productivity of the poorest in the world and distribute it up, and that's what they want the data for. We should be talking about data for the public good. We shouldn't be talking about privatizing and corporatizing data and giving them rights to collect. Why is it that only the collector of the data is seen as having rights? What about the producer? What about the worker who's working that data? Why aren't we talking more about data as a public good? The issue is whether society in the future will have access to this most valuable resource for public benefit and to solve humanity's problems, or if that data will be privatized, only available for private gain. That is what they're trying to do to make an end run around all the discussions happening right now where we're all talking about you know, the, the too, much too much power of these corporations over our democracy, over our media, over our education, over our relationships. Maybe we should break them up. They're doing an end run to lock in an international treaty to give them rights and keep government's paws off of them at the same time behind all of your back. So what's the, the, just the status update? As I said, various countries have made proposals starting with the US. Our corporations actually dominate business lobbies around the world too, so other countries, developed world, have been making proposals to try to gain a new mandate. In 2017, in the last ministerial, which was Buenos Aires in, in uh, Argentina, to launch new multilateral negotiations on this subject. Digital trade, they call it e-commerce, so you think it's a small thing, it's not, it's digital trade. And members of Our World is Not For Sale of our network got a hold of the documents, did analysis, and worked with developing country negotiators. And then an amazing thing happened at that ministerial. The developing country negotiators once again stood up and said, this is our future digital industrialization you're talking about? We are not giving away our data to Amazon and Google and Facebook and Microsoft for the rest of our lives for free. No, we're not doing it. And they stopped it. They stopped it. Yeah. This was a huge win for keeping open democratic space, for public interest regulation, for policy space for development, for job creation. Just think about how fast moving this technology is. We need to have that policy space to be able to respond to things as they happen. So there still are, however, a group of 76 countries that are negotiating, trying to negotiate agreement towards the next ministerial to finalize that in Kazakhstan, June 2020. These same provisions, uh, and I'll conclude with this, are actually in the TPP that Trump walked away from, but they're in the trade and services agreement that we successfully stopped. They're also in the new NAFTA, in USMCA, that almost nobody is talking about. So, in closing, I would just say, we need to convert, I think, our animosity and anger towards big tech generally for all of the ways that it's harming our communities and our environment and our futures into an effort to ensure that they do not write a new global economic constitution for themselves where they are actually in the driver's seat of setting the rules for the future global economy. 
And we need to convert that anger into a mass movement against the WTO. Let's do it together. Our world is not for sale. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name's Lisa. And I don't, I don't, <laughs> does anybody else need to take a breath after that? Yeah. Could we just maybe take a breath? Maybe reconnect. I watched myself, my energy sort of getting escalated and agitated because of what's happening, which is just another era of extraction and privatization and secrecy and ultimately how the dominant culture is trying to control our lives. Because let's be clear, data is us. It's how they are mining us so that they can then manipulate us to behave in ways that are not in our interest. So who here did not attend the WTO? Just raise your hand. Awesome. I really want to thank you for coming because Part of our culture teaches us to be ahistorical. I was just at an event, 120 youth, only two knew about the WTO. And what will become is based on what we have done. And if we don't know what has been done and we haven't taken the time to learn the lessons, we're not gonna ultimately get to where we need to be. And there were so many lessons that came out of the WTO. Today's actually another historical date that most people don't know about, but when I was in the streets of the WTO, I carried with me uh, not an ancestor of blood, but an ancestor of this lineage. Today would have been the 83rd birthday of Abby Hoffman. And I know that some of you in this room actually know who he is, <laughs> but a lot of people don't. But I do, you know, I feel like I'm so grateful for having had the opportunity to work with him to understand the power of creative resistance, of imagination, right? Because a radical imagination sets us free. And for me, that's a lot of what direct action is. We talk about direct action a lot, but what do we mean by that? Civil disobedience, direct action. Many people understand direct action as a strategy. We are willing to interrupt and put ourselves uh, in a dynamic of power, really. But for me over these years, I've really come to understand that direct action is a way of life. It's a lens through which I can view the world and the dynamics of power around me. And I know that when we in are willing to make a choice to use our power to improve things, and we do it intentionally, we do it with care, we do it with creativity, it's really a sacred act. It's a willingness to reconnect with our life force. And that's what happened in Seattle. That Tina, there is no alternative. Well, there's always an alternative. Change is inevitable. It's just what kind will it be? What alternatives do we have? And so at Seattle, we didn't only just rise up in fierce resistance. We rose up with fierce love for one another, taking care of one another, despite all the harm, psychological, emotional, physical, that was done to stop us. And that for me, and part of my work, because I'm a shut it down kind of girl, you know? I started shutting things down when I was young, CIA, bridges, uh, all kinds of things. And in fact, I have a book out called Shut It Down, Stories from a Fierce Loving Resistance. Because I know that when we shut things down, we're actually in a process of opening up a new space for something else to emerge. It's a simultaneous process. And again, as, we, as I started out talking about history, what will be is based on what comes before. And when we work together in the streets and we take care of one another, we make sure there's food, we make sure there's the support we need, we make sure there's art and culture and training, because that's one of the things that was so brilliant also about what we did here. We trained thousands of people to take a pie slice, shut it down, and that became the anchor for the thousands of more people who came. 
And that's one of the things we have to understand. It doesn't take millions of people. It can be small groups of people that can ignite the imagination and then others will come. And when we've built that care, um, it's easy to bring people inside the fold. So I guess I'll just um, wrap up <laughs> by, uh, again, expressing, expressing my gratitude for folks that came, for people willing to continue to put their bodies on the line. We have a big fight ahead of us, and we have a lot of life to still live, and we're starting it today. Thank you. Um, so, good morning, everyone. My name is Edgar with Familias Unidas por la Justicia. Thank you. We're an independent farm worker union out of Skagit County um, with over 600 members right now working under a, a contract um, at Takuma Brothers Farms, but we have over 1,000 members all over the United States now, and we're continuing to grow. So, um, you know, a lot of, we want to send our solidarity to all the organizers of this event with Heather and Simone and CAGJ um, for putting on this event to, um, you know, um, not to follow that whole thing about the world that the corporations are trying to build about how we forget um, all these struggles that we've, um, we've ever inherited and where we come from. So even from the 1919 general strike in Seattle um, to the WTO, you know, there's many more strikes and struggles that are happening locally and around the world. So we want to um, thank you all for helping us remember that. Um, uh, so my uh, story uh, um, from the WTO, um, I guess I never heard of the WTO either up, up until that summer of um, 1999. I was, at a, I was going to a Carlos Santana concert at the Gorgia George. <laughs> and uh, was anybody there? No, okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, uh, there was an opening act. I, it was really important to me to get there because there was an opening act, uh, a, uh, a band called Oso Matli that had to, <laughs> All right, yeah. And uh, they actually, you know, they were doing their set and putting on a cool show. And at the end of the concert, um, one of the guys that was on the trumpet, I think, he just got up on the mic. He's like, and we'll see you in Seattle for the WTO, and we're going to shut it down. So I was like, ever since then, that was like, that was my opening to find out more about the WTO. Um, but we never, you know, uh, uh, coming from a rural community in Mount Vernon, I grew up I, from Mount Vernon, um, we didn't have internet. It was still very expensive to have internet. Um, so there was really no way to find out what WTO was. Um, uh, so, you know, um, I was a student then, I was barely starting at Skagit Valley College, and I was part of an organization of uh, Chicano students, uh, Mecha, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. Um, luckily, the college had um, pretty good internet, so we just started doing research and just finding out more about the WTO. Um, still didn't understand what it did or what it was. Um, uh, I didn't like to read a lot at that time, but, you know, uh, we heard, you know, we, we were kind of familiar with terms like neoliberalism, neoliberalism and, um, you know, it was still kind of the movement of the Zapatista struggle was still fresh in our mind. And coming from, uh, uh, you know, a young student from Mexican family and farm workers, you know, the Zapatista struggle was something that was very near and dear to us and something that um, we wanted to learn from and build something like that locally in our, in our small community in Skagit County. Um, so, you know, over the course of a couple of months, you know, a small group of us uh, had made it a point to come to Seattle, even though none of us knew what the WTO was. Um, we just knew that this was a historical moment um, and that we as young people and coming from farm worker families that we needed to be there to represent our, our, our community. Um, um, you know, and you know, uh, if you don't know Skagit County, um, I don't know, it's still similar to the same of our agricultural big farms, run it, a lot of family farms that have been there for hundreds of years. Um, a lot of them are racist, exploit our people. 
Um, so our experience with white people had not been very good, even as a student, you know, we still had a whole bunch of racial profiling and racist um, names getting thrown at us throughout our whole experience growing up. Um, one of the first things that hit me when we first got to Seattle, we went to the union rally in, um, um, by the Space Needle, I think it was Memorial, is it Memorial Coliseum? Um, and uh, it was just a big, huge union rally, um, which made me really feel good. Um, another thing that was really surprising was just how much white people were there that were in solidarity. That was one of the first times that I ever seen um, white people, you know, talking about worker rights and standing on the side of workers. So, and made me feel good um, being there and hearing all the speakers and um, little did we know, um, eventually a lot of those people would help us be part of the boycott and um, participating in picket lines um, 20 years, almost 20 years after the fact of the WTO. Um, little did we know also that a lot of the important people of my life that had mentored me, that have mentored me ever since I started really organizing with farm workers um, in 2012 were there also. Um, people like Rosalinda Guillén, um, who at that time was at the, with the United Farm Workers. Um, Tomás Madrigal, which was a student uh, at a university. So all these people that are involved in the farm worker movement today, we were all there and in the WTO. I think because a lot of us were, had that same feeling where we wanted to um, participate in something that was bigger than us. Um, you know, we know about what happened with the the police and the repression, but we were motivated after seeing, you know, the resistance that was there, the new world that was being built, um, that we wanted to take that back to our community. We kind of lost our fear in some ways because we saw protesters like Nancy and, and the people here shutting things down, taking that energy back to a local community and knowing that we we're not gonna fear anymore. and. Um, Fast forward uh, to a couple years in 2013, I actually was in Bali at uh, one of the, the, I think it was the Doha rounds of negotiations still was happening at the WTO ministerial meeting in Bali. And when I would tell people, you know, you didn't, I was a small delegation from people from the United States. And I would tell people, uh, I'm from Washington. They're like, oh, you're from Seattle, from the WTO. So Seattle made um, history. Um, in 1999, um, not only here in the United States, but internationally, and um, has a high place in the, the history of the movement. So um, again, everybody that participated and um, shut things down, um, thank you all for, and even for coming here and organizing this event. Thank you all for sharing such important parts of the story and Deborah for coming from so far to make sure that we're all educated about what the WTO is all about still today. I know I've already done one event at Mohai about the history and there are urgent questions about things that were being left out. There's always things being left out because it's so, there was so many different things happening. Um, so it's not, it's not intentional if not all the stories are being told right now. We're just representing what we're a part of. Um, and all of you really touched our hearts too. So thank you so much. And we're now going to transition to the second part of our dialogue. So we're going to get to hear from um, a couple of speakers on how today's movements are using direct action to inspire us into the afternoon. So first we're going to hear from Paul Wagner, who is the founder of Protectors of the Salish Sea. And then we, um, unfortunately, Ramon Torres from Familia News por la Justicia could not join us today. Fortunately, we have Edgar, who is going to, in this part, talk a little bit more about uh, the actions leading up to and the founding of Familia News por la Justicia. So turn it over first to Paul and then back to Edgar. Thank you. O siem na stila cha na stila cha siem. Jenny White quench quella quench a tear. Quachil siem na stila cha. Chiokden sin a snat chalet sin a tula o siem. 
kom kom na sali the stay e the hacha tungal ta asiem and e achna hacha chek when the stay e the stlikas moksain asiem isla leatula asiem ya is in tetchel swahela siem na stilicha uh, I am Chiokden, um, the founder of Protectors of the Salish Sea, and uh, we've been doing work here uh, on different territories of our Coast Salish people. First, I want to raise my hands to the Duh Duwapsh, the Duwamish people, for, for loving this place like they would love their own child since time immemorial, to care for the water, knowing it's a living people, to have respect to speak to the Sali, the spirit of every living being that keeps us alive because they all do in a way that speaks to their soul. Their Sali is their spirit and we've communicated with the spirit of every living being here including water, the mountains, everything that feeds us and, and allows us to move forward and we've done this since time immemorial. So I raise my hands to the Duwamish people gratitude for that work so uh yeah you know we think about wto right it has the word trade in it is does that make any sense at all are we talking about trading things here are, are we talking about an ancient way of sharing things that are created with medicine with intention with love so that they move this world forward in a way of peace and harmony and balance? You guys can say no. <laughs> because that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about capitalism at the, at the most oppressive level, right? And, and so, you know, if we could put any pressure on them to change their name, because it's, it's an outright, uh, you know, lie that we're talking about trade. We are trade economy people here in Coast Salish territory. We are people who, who have a promise, a sacred promise for the circle of life. And greed is illegal here. It has been for tens of thousands of years. To oppress people is not part of our culture. To have capitalism is not part of who we are here at all. It never has been. And, and so we need to think about that. We need to think about what has always lived here and how that has happened. How did we create an economy that allowed every being to flourish for tens of thousands of years? And when today we're looking at basically the end of a stable climate and possibly a livable future for our children, because of these oppressions, because of these things that we, we stand up in front of. And uh, people have been using the word uh, protest, and that's fine, but that's a colonial viewpoint. And we, we have never protested anything as indigenous people. We've always protected. So I think we need to think about that also. We need to think about the knowing that those beings that, are, that were put here before us, what does a human being look like? A human being to us looks like, as our elders told us, we were put here last to lift up the ones that were put here before us. So when we think about what we're doing, all the different works that are happening globally, that has to do with protecting the circle of life, protecting our birthrights to clean water, protecting our cultures. As we watch our culture here in Coast Salish die in front of our eyes, the salmon going extinct. They're down to two to four percent. So we're fighting for our very existence right now. We're fighting with a prayer for our very existence right now. So when we stand in front of those oppressive powers, when we go inside a Chase Bank and shut them down, when we go in front of the Capitol, we walk 47 miles along the Salish Sea to tell Jay Inslee to stop killing our culture. 
your government's killing our salmon and that's who we are. We made a sacred promise to them. Stop destroying the future of our children now. We will not allow this to continue in this world. Our elders still stood strong for that. Our elder women said no. Our elder women are the last counseling place, the last voice spoken in Native America. We are matriarchal, meaning the council of elder women speak last. And usually the last voices spoken are always almost, list, you know, gone by, they go by that word, that suggestion. It's not a dominance. It's not a, a, a saying this is how, what we will do. But they're saying in so many ways, we will not harm the circle of life. And what we're talking about today is the harm to the circle of life through capitalism, through patriarchy, through colonization. And colonization is something that doesn't happen with your skin color. It's something that happens from here. This is where they've created everything here, from here. And so if we want to create a world for tomorrow, we need to start listening to the first peoples. We hold the owner, owner's manual to these places. We have a road map to paradise. We've already proven it. We've proven it. We created paradise here for tens of thousands of years where not one being was disrespected. Nobody was unemployed. Nobody was oppressed and held down. We are people who are not gender designated people. Most people don't even know that. We're spiritually designated people here in our Coast Salish territories. There's a lot to learn about our people here. And, and we need to think about the past along with the future. We need to take the words of our ancient people who raised the children, who taught them what a human being looks like. Because we're fighting oppressions that came from here, that came from the mind, from only thought of intellect. What can I do for myself? What can I reap for me, myself, and I? When our world is taught to only create from here, only create from here, can you put your hand on your heart for me and say the word hutch? Hutch. Can you say the word hachusida? That is the word that late Vi Hilbert, Taksha Blue, taught me, our dear grandmother, who saved the Lushutsi language, worked her whole life for that. And, and it's, she said this is one of her most beautiful words. It says that your entire being has an intellectual quality. And it's right here in a sacred place. Deborah Parker calls it your treasure chest, her elders taught her. Can you say that word again? Hachusida? Sounds like you're sneezing, hey? <laughs> That's how I get the kids to remember. And, uh, and so, so our other word is Natsamat. Can you say Natsamat? Natsamat. Gene Harry, a relative of mine, taught me this word. And he said, when he spoke in Lummi, and he said, my elder said, if you learn to use your Natsamat, and he put his hand on his heart, said, my elder said, I'd hear the wisdom of my ancestors from the beginning, now and into the future, and I would never lose what's intended for me, the wisdom that's intended for me, because now I have a sacred place to put it. But he said, my elder said, if I only use these, and he grabbed his ear and wiggle, can you grab your ear and wiggle it? He said, if I only use these, It'll probably go in one side, rattle around, and drop out the other side, right? Yeah, because this is not intended for wisdom. These are things that have never been taught here in the colonial school. I went to one of the best funded schools in all America, in Redmond, Washington, where Bill Gates built his little empire. 
and currently probably doesn't pay hardly any tax at all, right? Along with uh, Jeff Bezos. And uh, so, you know, the things that our elders brought us have showed us a, a road map to paradise. And after they kidnapped every one of our children and abused them to death because four of my uncles died in the residential school on Cooper Island on Vancouver Island, they never walked away, never. Died pre-teenage, abused to death. Well, you know, when, when they came back, if the ones that survived made it home, because the literal motto is kill the Indian, save the man, the literal outright motto. When they did come home to that bank of wisdom called elders, bank of knowledge of what a human being looks like and, and how to live in this world and, and, and educational system governance of our people because elders raise children in Native America. Most people don't know that, but they do, not the parents. How many parents think that's a great idea? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then so they came home and they came back and they were so severely abused they couldn't even say good morning to this bank of wisdom. That was the government's plan. They knew this would happen. How do you kill us? How do you kill us? You remove the Indian from us. Now they couldn't even say hello. They couldn't even say good morning. They, these were strangers. These guys never spoke no English at all. And these ones would never utter a word of huilnuch, of native language, because they were so abused. Now, for, now those elders just go away. They stay hidden. They go away. And that's where we're at today. Those elders are nearly extinct from the culture. Now it's up to us. So uh, I'm asking people to stand with the first peoples. We have the strongest muscle in the state of Washington to win over the oppressions of colonialism. We have the supreme law of the land on our side. Most of our tribes and Duwamish still needs their recognition. But they, I mean, I, I think that we could just claim sovereignty and just say, we, I mean, we already do, right? And, and, and just say, we're sovereign and, and, and we create our own laws and you guys need to obey them here on our territories, right? <laughs> and, and so when, when the last campaign for 350 Seattle was to evict Chase, and that, that's been my prayer for two years now. And unfortunately, I wasn't even able to attend that because we walked those 47 miles along the Salish Sea and then set up four indigenous structures on Stachas, our village site, where they put the state capital. And we proclaimed that of return to the bones of my ancestors. And we've been here 30,000 years since time immemorial, and I'm not going anywhere. And, yeah, you can clap for that. And now we, we are not leaving until we acquire a future for a culture, our salmon, and the beings that depend on it, including you and I, and, and then terminate current fossil fuel expansion projects after you declare climate emergency, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then so uh, we lasted the whole day. Uh, all of our uh, people who attended uh, showed up, many other people showed up, and then, uh, and then they sent 70 riot police, Jay Inslee's state riot police, to sweet and armored. Uh, they had rubber bullet guns, they had full riot gear. They came and, and they thought that we would just run. But we stayed in prayer. Begin with a prayer and end with a prayer. So when I just spoke to you, I gave a little prayer here. But um, So in that prayer, those songs, it was, it was big, it was huge. It was bouncing off the sky. And, and, and some of those, as our people came together and held together like a clump of stinging that like, couldn't be pulled apart, you know, some of those state officers had tears in their eyes. And they couldn't move forward when they were instructed to. They'd never, never dreamt that there would be a power like that, that they could feel, tangibly feel, and look in the eyes of the young people who look just like their kids and realize that they're oppressing them. They're following the instruction of a colonial government that is going to take their lives if they keep reaping and reaping and reaping. 
and they, they wouldn't move forward, a few of them. And I went and spoke to each and every one of them and let them know that we're related, that that oppressive power there has taken everything we've loved here as indigenous people, including the lives of our children at 95% annihilation, right? Ancient forest, natural animal, and an indigenous human beings. And, and I said, that they're, they're expanding that right now, that movement. And I said, within one or two years, you'll make your choice. You'll either stand for the very lives of your children, or you'll keep taking orders from these guys who have never had an elder except for maybe thousands of years ago. They never had uh, elder women to guide them towards life. And, and, and they only know to reap and reap, and they'll reap until they take the lives of your children and mine. And you need to make your choice here within one or two years as the world changes that fast. And a lot of them couldn't look me in the eyes. They just couldn't look me in the eyes at all. And, you know, and, and so we need to come together as a human family. And that's what this is about. Coming together as one family, not samat. The other meaning for not samat is one heart, one mind, one prayer, one house. That referred to a chakait lung, a long house. But now our house has gotten much larger and smaller. It's our mother earth. We're all in one house. And we know it now today, as the prophecies told us. And now we must come together and put out this fire of destruction to do with colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, and, and just raw oppression and the destruction of life upon these lands. So I just wanted to share a little bit of our, our histories here. And, and let you know that, that we've been fighting this since time immemorial with a prayer, with instruction, sacred instruction from our elders. So what we're doing here is nothing new on these lands. It's just nothing new. To stand in front of a great threat to the existence of our culture and our children's future has been worked on since time immemorial here. And we're still working on it today just in a different way with a different circumstance. So um, uh, I just want to thank the organizers, Haishka, CM. Thank you. Thank everyone who's done this work to come together to bring equity into this world, to, to bring a, 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 a wellness to Mother Earth. And uh, so maybe we can just change the name of WTO, hey? Eh? And we can force them to do it. <laughs> and uh, does it... It seems like a lie to me, and I'm tired of lies. I'm tired of Jay Inslee saying he's a, a, a hero for climate, and then he does nothing. That's why we're calling him out. That's, we're still at the Capitol, and if you want to join us, every morning we're in prayer on the steps of Capitol doing ceremony in the morning. And we're still have, we just had a decolonization of uh, what is known as Thanksgiving right in front of Jay's house on the beach in Bainbridge Island. Yeah, that's right. And uh, 75 of us showed up and uh, we set up a tarpy on the beach and then we uh, went and did ceremony in his front lawn and laid a, we, we sang and held our banners and, and prayed there and then read a letter. One of our elder women read a letter to him and, and we laid out cedar boughs off to the east. The east is a representation of where we ask life to come into our being. So our poignancy there was to ask Jay to walk that path of cedar bough, our tree of life, off to the east and stop going the opposite direction towards death for our culture and death for our children's future because that's where they're going right now. They're going there hard and fast with the expansion of enormous fossil fuel projects in the state of Washington when he claims to be a green, uh, you know, he was a candidate for presidency, but he's the highest office in the state of Washington. So, so we're calling him out on that. And we're continuing to do that so that we can win. And we're going to get our 29 tribes on board. I went to Centennial Accords where James Lee met with 29 tribes right in Squaxin. And, uh, and I talked to every council person and chief I could talk to. 
and told them, you know, 11,000 scientists just declared a global climate emergency three days ago. Over a thousand governmental factions worldwide have declared climate emergencies so far. The entire confederacy of Alaska tribes have declared climate emergency. There were 244 glaciers in the Olympic Mountains in 1937. Now there's 162. I said, this is the world we live in, and these guys are responsible for that. And we need to do something about it. We need to come together. We need to do what they did in British Columbia and do a pull together a Raven Trust and gather hundreds of millions of dollars from the common person in the state of Washington. Give it to our 29 tribes who have the biggest muscle for defeating these guys, for robbing our culture and our children's future and just win in court with them. And they're all shaking their heads, yes. Absolutely, yes. Every one of them. Every one of them. So we're ready to win. So we need your support if you want to go to Protectors of the Salish Sea Facebook page or you can go Protectors of the Salish Sea at gmail.com and send us a message. Haishka, thank each and every one of you for your work. Keep, keep coming together. Keep rising up. Keep being strong. Do it in a prayer. Make sure our people are there. Make sure you do it in a good way. Do it in an indigenous way. Do it with a prayer. Do it with the power of the indigenous people. And, and decolonize your work to save and to, to bring life back to Mother Earth and preserve the future of our children and our cultures. OCM, Aishka, thank each and every one of you. Omasi stuff. Oh, thank you, Paul, and the protectors of the Salish Sea for, for all the work that you do. We know that. Um, here in Washington State or anywhere, um, if we don't follow the leadership of, of indigenous people, we're going to be in, in trouble. So we always stand in solidarity, especially in a time like this when mega projects and, you know, the last, the fight for resources right now is intensifying, um, not only for, for the data, the digital data, um, um, oil, Water is now up for grabs, not only here in the United States, but also all throughout the world. Um, um, so to talk a little bit about the direct action of Familias Unidas, um, and if you don't know much about Familias Unidas, um, so the membership is all indigenous Mexicans coming from Oaxaca and Guerrero um, that many don't speak English or Spanish, um, they still primarily speak their traditional, their native language. Um, so, you know, to understand even the, that history, you have to, you know, you have to really understand, the, I think this is what, an important point, what the WTO and NAFTA and all these free trade agreements have done to the home countries that have displaced millions of people um, around the world and, right, and in our community, especially from, from Mexico. When NAFTA was implemented, the, the agreements um, pretty much gave all the powers to corporations to rewrite constitutions, and that's what happened in Mexico when Article 26 was rewritten, which basically did away with the communal um, um, farming system known as the Hidos, um, and opened it up for privatization. Um, so this had a tremendous effect, that and the um, opening up the markets to GMO corn seeds, which devastated the local economies in, in, in Mexico, which caused a mass migration, um, uh, people leaving their homelands and looking for a place to sustain themselves. Many of them migrated up here to the United States, and some of them ended up here in, in Washington. Um, so these are the communities that have been hurt by these bad trade policies. Um, when they get here in the United States, instead of finding prosperity or uh, a good opportunity, they find the exploitation um, that is done by um, corporate agriculture and agribusiness. Um, the, I think it's no accident that Familias Unidas was formed in this very time of, of neoliberal agriculture and commodities in, in our foods. Um, so, the fight that Familias Unidas um, 
started, I think was a pretty unique one, especially at a political moment in 2013 and 20 till 2016 when he finally got the contract. That was the kind of the moment where there was very, um, you know, there was mass deportations going on under the Secure Communities program from Obama. There was um, the, you know, the rise of the, the right, the ultra right wing with Donald Trump calling Mexicans rapists and drug dealers. Um, but yet at the same time, farm workers in my community were able to organize themselves and fight not only the biggest farm in Skagit County, uh, Sycamore Brothers Farms, but also the biggest uh, berry distributor in the whole world, which was Driscoll's. Um, and you know, none of that was done uh, because you know we were, you know, the corporation Driscoll's thought that it was the right thing to do to give farm workers a decent wage and treat them right. It was done through through struggle and direct actions. Um, Pretty early on, a lot of people were like, you can't take on Driscoll's, there's the, like, the, this huge, you know, you can't go anywhere in the world without seeing like a little Driscoll's like raspberry or um, um, blueberries or strawberries. You know, what are you guys doing? Um, uh, you know, and it's also illegal for, or it, for farm workers, or it's not recognized if you organize as a union for farm workers. You're not legally protected by the National Labor Relations Board. So you can be organizing for a thousand years and calling yourself a farm worker uh, union, but if your employer doesn't recognize you, then there is no, no legal, legally bound anything to be recognized as a union. The only way that you're going to get a union contract is through pressuring the employer to sit down and negotiate a, a collectively bargaining agreement. Um, and since we don't belong to the National Re Relations Labor Relations Board, um, we have to get creative. And you know, and remembering the history of the farm worker movement in the United States, that's primarily farm workers have won um, boy, uh, stri um, contracts is through going on strike. Um, going direct action against their employer and also going, taking their case to the public by boycotting. So for three and a half years, farm workers were able to go to Whole Foods, um, every corporate chain uh, where they would sell Driscoll's, go not only stand outside and pick it, but go inside the stores and, and pick it as well and called all those people to um, stop buying Driscoll's. Um, and it was a pretty interesting thing to see. Um, you don't see many uh, farm workers on picket lines, um, especially in our community. And I think that really presented a whole different face to not only labor organizing, uh, but also to the immigrant movement that was, that was occurring in that time because um, I think because of the attacks, the constant attacks and the rhetoric and the rise of the right, I think people expected us to just kind of shut down and be quiet. But, you know, because of the urgency of the moment and it was what needed, direct action was needed, the organizing actually picked up. Um, you know, we were also seeing what was happening here in Seattle with the Fight for 15 and um, all these other movements for, to call for, for dignity for workers. And the workers saw that and were motivated. Um, eventually, after three years of picketing and boycotting, um, going on strikes, over 40 strikes in three years at their workplace, on a tour for the whole West Coast, where they were able to meet with farm workers from all over um, the West Coast that do that migration from California up to Washington and back. We were able to meet with all of them. Um, um, you know, and all they said was like, you know, you got to keep going because this is what we need right now. Um, we don't get many victories for farm workers, so after three and a half years of fighting and your support, if you boycotted Driscoll's and didn't buy berries for three and a half years, thank you. Um, we won the first union contract and officially uh, were recognized as uh, the first Farm Worker Union to be formed in over 30 years in the United States. And, and again, the historic nature of it, um, the historic people that are undocumented, don't speak English, indigenous, get discriminated not only here, but in their home countries. Um, they were able to beat a corporation 
Um, and because that was through direct action, not by being polite and you know, following the rules or voting, they actually had to go down the streets and challenge power where it is. So that was kind of our direct action. And I think all of the stuff from the WTO and all the fights that happen on the streets, we uh, directly attribute a lot of that to, to our organizing that we took it. Um, and we attribute that, um, the victory to a lot of the, those kind of struggles that were taking direct action. Deep, deep appreciation for Paul and Edgar for grounding us in the very long history of indigenous people engaging in direct action that we are very much on the shoulders of. So let's give them another round of applause. I'm going to turn it over to Heather. So we, this is when we're going to move into folks being able to dialogue with one another. So we're running a little behind schedule, but we have about five or six minutes for folks to turn to who you're sitting next to. Um, and we have these questions. Um, so we just want you to have a chance to reflect with one another. So try to talk to someone you don't know if you can. Just two or three people. Go around, say your name and pronouns. And these questions. Where were you in November 1999? What are your reactions to what you just heard? Did this spark a memory you want to share? So we just want to invite our um, fantastic guests to share any final reflections that they might have. And then we're going to go over some logistics and have a closing. So I just wanted to share um, a few things, and I have a lot of thoughts from our uh, incredible speakers, but really what I want to make sure everyone knows who wasn't there was what a beautiful day uh, November 30th, 1999 was, because there was so much art and music and creativity, and that we weren't just um, laying on the street. We were laying on the street surrounded by beauty. And I feel like so much of what this movement has been about and so much of um, how the work has continued is bringing that creativity and that beauty and taking care of each other and making sure that we are um, that we are all connected and that we are all working towards something larger than ourselves. And so we wanted to end um, this session with a prayer song from the Coast Salish people. Yeah, we're doing, because we know this will put us in our heart place, and we need to do some logistics and be in our head place for a minute. So, um, first of all, I definitely feel very nourished from our panel today. Can we give one more round of applause for all our fantastic panelists? Okay, now other forms of nourishment. Um, if you have, um, so lunch is next, um, and we are going to be breaking for 45 minutes for lunch. Um, if you have a ticket, go downstairs, so not just one floor down, but two floors down, um, and you can exchange that for something edible. Um, if you did not get a ticket, um, there are other places, or if you have needs to get food outside. If you go downstairs where we came in, there is a listing of a whole bunch of different restaurants that are in walking distance. So if you can't find that, you can ask folks at registration and they can point you there. But lots of places that you can go. Oh, okay. Um, and then in the afternoon, we are going to be having some incredibly scrumptious trainings. So first, as we mentioned, and I wonder if folks can raise their hands so you know who you're looking for. Um, so we have Lisa, who is um, doing the three-hour Escalating Resistance Mass Rebellion training. Woo! Woo! We have Deborah, who is doing a new global economic constitution by Amazon. What is happening with the WTO and what can we do about it? We also have Matt and Jess. Can you put your hands up? Matt, Remmel, and Jess Wallach. Do we see hands up? 
Do I see hands up? I don't see your hands. Okay, they might not have come yet. That is the Green New Deal. And then we have Ashley and Fetcher from La Resistencia. Do we see them? All right, you will see them. We will direct you to them. They are doing a workshop on campaign to permanently shut down the Northwest Detention Center. Woohoo! So tough choices, and we will help direct you to where you need to go post lunch. And then I forgot to mention in the opening that we also have a closing plan. So Jim Page, who wrote a really beautiful song about the WTO protests, is here to perform that and other music. We'll have a closing reflection. Um, and then if you can stay, if you want to, we actually have a direct action plan. So at 545, we'll leave here. You can stay and help us clean up, and then we'll march together with this banner and others down to 7th and Pike, 8th and Pike, which is where the convention center is located. We'll be projecting photos and video of the 99 protests onto the convention center and taking that intersection and making art. So we invite you to join us. And after that, at 8 o'clock at Vermilion Gallery, we're having a dance party. Um, come early, so uh, there's only room for 80 people. There will also be projections um, throughout that gallery um, throughout the evening. So um, one other thing, which is next Saturday, a week from now, we'll be back here in Town Hall, but we're starting Washington Fair Trade Coalition has invited a lot of those lead organizers um, from 1999 for a rally at Occidental Square, I believe at 10.30, followed by a march to the federal building, and then there'll be a break, and from 3.30 to 6.30, there's workshops here on all different issues in the intersection with trade, and then at 7, Lori Wallach um, from Global Trade Watch and Joseph Stieglitz, the Nobel Prize winning progressive economist, will be giving a keynote here at Town Hall next week. So yeah, there's all sorts of stuff going on to, to keep celebrating this and marking this anniversary. So thanks for your attention and thank you, Paul, for offering to close us. We're going to sing a Goku Bop song. Goku Bop is our changer, our creator, created all the things that we know and love and uh, created all of us. And, uh, and it asks Joker Bot to make her mind right, or her heart right, uh, her spirit right, uh, body right, and to make everything well in this world, and make everything as creator and